Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Victoria University of Wellington, I want to welcome you all to this public lecture. My name is Giro Karajolo. I'm the head of the School of Government at Victoria University School of Business. Our guest today is Simon Upton. Simon is the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. He is a Fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand and a Rhodes Scholar. He has degrees from Auckland University, he'll be forgiven for that, and Oxford University, and Oxford University. He, is a member of, he was a member of Parliament between 81 and 2000, and he, had ministerial, he held ministerial portfolios between several of them, between 1990 and 1999. Then he went to the OECD to chair the Roundtable on Sustainable Development, came back to New Zealand for a while, and then went back to the OECD in 2010 to be a full-time as a environment director at the OECD, where he was for several years until he came back to New Zealand very recently to take up his new position. Simon's topic today is a Zero Carbon Act for New Zealand. That's based on a report that was just released. We are delighted to have Simon here as our speaker, and uh, he'll talk for about 30, 35 minutes. And then he is very happy, in fact, keen to receive your questions. Thank you very much, Simon. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Garol. About a month ago, maybe six weeks, I produced this report. There are some copies there, if, like me, you prefer paper to the virtual version, at least for scribbling in margins, entitled A Zero Carbon Act for New Zealand, Revisiting Stepping Stones to Paris and Beyond. Uh, my report explained the bones of the UK policy idea uh, that was examined by the GLOBE group of parliamentarians last year, uh, expounded upon by Lord Deben, who is the current chairman of the Climate Committee in the UK, and was then endorsed uh, by my predecessor, uh, Dr Jan Wright, and her report was entitled Stepping Stones to Paris and Beyond. So what I did when I arrived in my job and after um, two weeks when there was no government, when I, I actually became commissioner without a government. So there was this wonderful, wonderful moment of calm. It reminded me of the, the Belgian situation. Uh, one, one is almost tempted to say, um, you know, do we need a government? Things seem to be going on. Things were going smoothly. Of <laughs> uh, course, they do it for months. We just did it for a shorter period. But um, almost immediately, a government was then formed that was committed to introducing the sort of approach that the United Kingdom had proposed, so I decided to produce a report uh, which was revisiting uh, her report. I reiterated Dr. Wright's call for broad-based cross-party support as had been achieved uh, in the UK, but I took some trouble to identify the things which make New Zealand's climate challenge very different indeed from that facing the UK. And you'll find these set out in the first half of the report. I talk about the different political context, the different international context, and the ambitions of the countries in terms of how they uh, think about climate uh, in, as a global issue, our very different emissions trajectories, and our emission profiles. And I explained why making physical emissions progress in New Zealand will be much harder than in the United Kingdom. Notwithstanding that, underlined in bold, I maintained that the political challenge is essentially no different, and that the way in which legislation is designed and enacted is critically important, the process of putting this to bed, and that is what I'm going to focus on today. Now, the most important element of the UK model is the way it has disconnected the long-term goal of a very low emissions economy from short-term tactical politics. And the Brits did that by legislating for a 2050 target and then elaborating well into the future a series of progressively smaller carbon budgets. My predecessor called them stepping stones. And that if you met those progressive budgets, 
your emissions would come down towards the target. Now, the key words I've just uttered are well into the future. Because at the heart of the UK model is a decoupling of budget setting from budget implementation. Every five years, the UK Parliament is asked to ratify a budget that won't take effect for a decade or more into the future. That's what's happening there. Designing the policies needed to get on track to meet these future budgets is kept well apart from the process of setting them. The time lag between setting a budget and living with its consequences is what makes this very long-term policy making possible. Just think about it. It's easier, isn't it, to take decisions today about events a decade in respect of which policies will gradually be put in place over the years ahead than it is to implement things with immediate impact. I suspect that's what happens around cabinet tables and in parliament. Oh yes, this looks challenging. Oh well, of course, it's actually in the 2030s. That is what is happening. Now, it took me some time to come to grips with the significance of the budgets and their timing, but it's really, really important. The project has to ensure that we chart a long-term pathway that will change the mix of long-term investment. The wisdom and impact of short-term policy making will always be and rightly so, subject to robust debate. But when we know that within an increasingly limited time frame, we have to decarbonise our economy, and we've signed up internationally to do just that, we can't have our long-run objectives hijacked year in, year out by short-term politics. If in the process of enacting a target and setting up a commission to advise on those carbon budgets, we end up embroiled in a debate about how particular policies affecting particular industries should be designed, we will end up back where we started, arguing over the short term. So let me explain, I want to go through this in some detail, by taking you through first the timeline that the UK government used to launch its budget setting process. And we're now back in the first decade of the century. So they introduced their climate change bill early in 2007. And they set up their interim climate committee in October. And then while the bill was chugging through Parliament and they'd started off with a 60% below uh, by 2050 target, they asked the Climate Committee, look, can we ratchet this up to 80%? And the Climate Committee came back and said, yes, you can. Now remember, the Parliament in which this was being launched was wildly in favour of long-term action because the opposition leader, who happened to be a Tory, David Cameron, decided he was going to be the greenest Tory leader ever, and this was his uh, signature uh, piece. And the government was delighted because they hadn't been <laughs> to make much progress, so they endorsed it, so all of Parliament was in behind. But still, that's the process. That target, that very ambitious target of minus 80 was endorsed by this highly technical, highly skilled committee, even before it was actually legally in place, saying, yes, we think that 80% below is doable. So then, come late 2008, the bill was enacted with that target, minus 80, and it, it's, it looks like a small gap, it's even smaller, just Four days later, four days after enactment, the commission, uh, sorry, the committee, as it was then, no longer the interim committee, said, here you are, here's our advice on the first three budgets, the first 15 years of the life of the system, wham, just like that, four days later. They had worked on it as an interim committee, and they were able to say, there you are. There's the first 15 years, 
And that was enacted about three or four months later, and bingo. The, the, the future, the next 15 years, the medium term was locked in with virtual unanimity in Parliament. And then the government got down to policy. How was it going to implement policy in a way which would lead you over time to stay within that trajectory? Then there was a general election in May 2010 when the greenest leader of the Tory party had to uh, do a deal with the Liberal Democrats to become Prime Minister. And that's when the rubber really hit the road, because the Climate Committee then brought down advice on a fourth budget, uh, which was in the middle of 2011, and that was enacted a few months later. And then the government had to respond to that. So you see, this commission set up uh, and acted, was able to act very, very swiftly. In a nutshell, the UK Climate C Committee had done its homework in advance of its creation. Just four days after that legislation was passed, the committee proposed those three budgets. Now, it was easier for them to do them than it would be for us in this sense. Their emissions have been tracking down for the last 20 years. They had EU directives telling them that they had to do this and that by 2020. So it was to some extent, although when you say this to them, they get quite twitchy, but to some extent, it was easy uh, for them. But that's really not the important point. What's important is that in one swoop, they got rid of the near-term budgets and were immediately able to turn their attention to the medium to long term. Um, and the first budget, therefore, as you can see, that they actually the first real budget that they proposed was that fourth one spanning 2023 to 2027, and that was quite controversial. The, the, the government accepted it, and then the Chancellor of the Exchequer got cold feet, and for fiscal reasons, this is post GFC, so he stripped out the billion pounds that was going to be going to, to CCS. He tried to fiddle around with what was happening on insulation of homes. It was a series of things they did. And he actually tried to assert that he wasn't bound by it anyhow, and the Climate Committee said, actually, you are. And so the government then said, all right, well, why don't you review the whole thing in the light of circumstances? And so they did. They actually effectively reviewed the entire thing that they'd proposed and had, had enacted. And they said, we, we can find no reason why this isn't doable. Sorry, we won't change it. And the government basically had to acquiesce. Uh, now, it was controversial and it survived, but because the political debate was about something 15 years away, there wasn't any immediate political benefit to anyone in trying to sabotage it. That is the point I'm wanting to make to you. Now let's take a look at what the process ahead of us here in New Zealand looks like. So, we have an interim commission appointed just last week. And the government has said it's going to consult on the target and mechanisms for the Act, but they've asked the Interim Commission to look at two issues. One around agriculture and the ETS, and the other around renewables. And from what we can see, it looks as though the bill will actually be introduced later this year, I don't know, October-ish. And the plan is to get that enacted. Um, in the first quarter of next year. So one assumes that the public consultation on the target will then enable the government to put a target into the bill and uh, they will um, get that through you know, about 12 months from now. In the meantime, there's going to be advice coming from the Climate Commission on agriculture into the ETS and can we get to uh, zero uh, emissions or, uh, in power generation renewables 100% by 2035. And I assume that that will then, on the basis of the device, wash up into policy implementation. There is no mention so far of budgets. We don't know what's going to happen, but we do know that there'll be an election late in 2020. There are three things to note here. In the next few months, the government will be consulting publicly on the target that will go into the legislation and the role and status of the new Climate Commission. 
Now, I provided some detailed suggestions about the latter, which you can read in my report. In addition to that public consultation, I think we would all benefit from the advice of the Interim Commission on the question of the target. The Paris Agreement set an ambitious target of holding warming well below two degrees and recognised that in order to do this, emissions need to peak soon and rapidly fall thereafter. The longer term aim being to balance sources and sinks in the second half of the century. I'm truncating a very long Article 4 piece of text. A 2050 target needs to reflect this goal, but as I explained in my report, further study is needed as to whether the same target should apply to each of the three main gases, and this is a highly technical matter. Clearly, gases that accumulate in the atmosphere, so-called stock gases, can't be allowed to go on accumulating, so getting them down to zero or having a negative emissions technology to offset them is required. But the same may not apply to methane, which is short-lived, a so-called flow gas, a flow that is lower than at present, but still more than zero, may well be compatible with no additional warming, or depending how far down you drive it, maybe even some cooling. Referring the question to the Commission makes sense for two reasons. Firstly, it is technical, and that is what the Commission is there for, to provide independent technocratic advice to decision makers. So if you are in government, you can say, look, we didn't make this up in a cabinet committee. We have taken the best advice available to us in New Zealand on this subject. Secondly, given that the Commission's long-term job will be to propose stepping stone budgets to get to the legislated target, it has to be confident that the right target has been proposed and enacted in the first place. I have to say, if I was on that Commission, I would want to know that the target I was supposed to be steering for held water. I don't think it's too late to add this critical question to the Interim Committee's agenda. Now, the second thing to note is that the government has asked the Interim Commission to examine how, and I quote, surrender obligations could best be arranged if agricultural methane and nitrous oxide emissions enter into the New Zealand Emissions Trading Scheme, the ETS. Now, this is certainly a technical matter that the Commission will indeed be well placed to look into, but it is also a policy implementation matter with a rather more immediate time frame. It means that the immediate focus on the Commission during the time that the all-important legislation on targets and processes is being debated will be on a very, very contentious implementation issue. Now, assuming that the government accepts my advice that the Commission should have only recommendatory powers, this is a matter that will ultimately be decided by the government. Whether agriculture goes into the ETS in the short term is for the government, it's not for the Commission. I just make this observation, there's no unique way to deal with agriculture or for any sectoral emissions. You can use taxes, subsidies, regulations, all sorts of things. And yes, you can use the ETS. I'll be bringing a report down later in the year examining some different ways to bring down agricultural emissions going forward. I say different, including the ETS. But the how of it, the how of it is a second order issue. The first order issue is getting the long-term goal enacted, which must include all gases, and with it the mechanism for enacting carbon budgets. That's the big prize. That's what puts the long-term at arm's length from the short-term. There is a risk that if we become embroiled in the debate over agriculture's entry into the ETS at the same time that we are trying to enact a long-term goal and a process to get there, the short-term issue will overwhelm the long-term one. That's exactly what the UK avoided. So every effort must be made to keep the two issues well apart. Which brings me to my third point, the importance of budgets in putting the focus on the medium to long term. 
Now, as I've illustrated in the case of the UK, being able to settle the early budgets right at the outset is the best way of ensuring that intention is then shifted to the long term where it belongs. The reality, folks, is that there's not a lot that can be done in the short term to radically reduce emissions. We will have to halt the upward curve and bend it down. It takes time for medium or long-lived assets to turn over, whether we're talking about the car fleet or boilers in industry. The really serious debate to which the new Commission swiftly needs to turn its attention is how we ready the economy for really significant reductions in the 2030s. They are only 12 years away, the 2030s. But that should be long enough to implement policies and research that will unlock real structural changes that start to seriously decarbonise the economy a decade or more for now. So how can we bypass short-term politics to rescue the longer term? Now, let me at this point show you the sequencing I proposed in my own report. I thought we should introduce the bill with the Paris target, some version of the words which match Article 4 of uh, the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, which has been agreed to, you'll recall, by the previous government. And then simultaneously set up the Interim Climate Commission, and you get the thing enacted quite quickly. But you should have asked the Interim Climate Commission in advance that you wanted advice on that target. What realistically, gas by gas or however, should the target be? And you recommend that back to the government, and then the government takes a refined target to the House for further enactment. So it means that the entire parliament has looked at expert advice on a target, and then hopefully all voted for it. And then all I've got on this is the fact that there's an election there and an election there. And you may well say, what about budgets? Because you've just talked about them. Now, I don't have them in my report in that way. I did, however, mention them. And here's what I said. New Zealand will be unable to capitalise on a favourable emissions trend that allows debate over difficult choices to be confined to budget periods well out in the future. As a result, expectations about the first budget periods will need to be carefully managed. It will be important that arguments over the ambition of the first two or three carbon budgets do not become an obstacle to subsequent budgets. The whole point of the UK model is to send a clear signal about medium and long-term expectations to provide certainty for those making long-lived investments that need to be consistent with a low carbon pathway. Carbon budgets for the post-2030 period are needed soon if New Zealand's long-run emissions trajectory is to have a chance of being steered onto a pathway consistent with the net zero goal." Unquote. I wish I had said more. It seems to me that to give this system the best chance of bedding down in New Zealand with our fiendishly short electoral cycle we need to bank two six-year budgets almost on day one. And you'll note in my report I recommend six years, not five, and I spell out the reasoning. But it's, it is linked to the, how often you can ask Parliament to look at these things. The reason I proposed those six-year budgets was to fit the electoral cycle. If every second Parliament was asked to adopt a new budget to come into effect ten years down the track, that would reduce the risks of analysis and debate descending into a dogfight over the shorter term. But for that to work, you've got to get the first 12 years under your belt at the outset. Now, I don't believe this has to be a laborious or contentious business. The previous government announced a nationally determined contribution that was, in effect, an offer of minus 11% below our 1990 level of emissions by 2030. It doesn't sound very ambitious, and in one sense it isn't, but given that we would need to reverse our current increasing trend, 
It's no easy affair. We have, in effect, wasted 25 years and locked in a lot of emissions-intensive technologies from which we will have to unwind. I would be inclined to seek advice from the, inter the Interim Commission on the first two budgets using the current NDC as the baseline. This NDC, as a minimum, already has support across the political spectrum. Now, there will be those who say it's insufficiently ambitious. I'm inclined to agree. The Commission could be asked if we can do better. But really, it should be saving its powder and shot for the third budget period covering 2031 to 2036 on my system of budgets. So that's where the Commission will have to do a great deal of homework and test out technically and economically doable strategies to generate a really ambitious number. So with that in mind, it is good to see that the government has asked the Interim Commission to investigate the possibilities for going to zero emissions from power generation by 2035. That's a genuinely strategic question, uh, more so than the short-term consideration of how agriculture might enter the ETS. It's a question about what can be done in the medium term, in other words, over the first three budgets, to bring power generation emissions to zero. Now, there is, of course, a similarly medium-term challenge for our agricultural emissions, and it's absolutely clear that by the time we get to the third budget, there will have to be more significant contributions from the agricultural sector than anything we might imagine in the near term, whether it's using the ETS or not. So, with these thoughts in mind, let's look again at the proposed timeline. So, let's start with enactment sometime in the first quarter of next year, which is what I think uh, matches the government's uh, time frame. I think there would be merit in charging the Interim Commission with the task of developing budgets for the years 2019 to 2024 and 2025 to 2030 with a view to proposing them immediately after the Zero Carbon Bills enactment in April next year. The government could then have them adopted by Parliament and the ship would be launched. The third budget to cover the period 2031 to 2036 would then be proposed to the government immediately after the 2020 election in early 2021. So there's the election and the Commission could come up with its advice on the third budget and then you enact it. Then in 2024, following the 2023 election, there'll be a formal review of progress placed before Parliament. So not a new budget, but a review of progress. And so the cycle of regular budgets and review would be underway. And by the way, in talking to the Climate Committee in the UK, they did say that five years with nothing in between was too long because they said there's a revolving door on the public service. I'm sure that's unfamiliar here. And there's a loss of institutional memory and politicians think they put it to bed and you know, then you've all got to start from scratch. So, uh, and I thought, well, hang on, you can't do two and a half years uh, and six would be too long if you had nothing. So that's how I came to the six with a review at three, each parliament addressing the issue once and early in its life. So, what about bringing agriculture into the ECS or dealing with it in some other way? As I've said, this is an implementation issue. It didn't have to be referred to the Interim Commission, though I'm sure it will add value to this debate. But the important thing is that the Parliament's focus is directed in the first place to the medium and long term. In my view, it would help if deciding the question of how to deal with agricultural emissions focus is moved out beyond the adoption of the enactment of the bill and the first two budgets. If there's disagreement about how we set about requiring a reduction of agricultural emissions, that doesn't need to be the end of the world. It's a policy implementation issue. But if the debate on that topic spills over and poisons the enactment of the long-term target, the creation of the commission and the institution of these carbon budgets then we could put at risk the best opportunity in a generation to put this issue on a longer-term footing. 
Now, I'm happy to tell you that I have personally witnessed some of our parliamentarians on both sides of the aisle, which has now become part of our lexicon with endless American commentary to this effect, both sides of the aisle engaging one another in a serious way on these issues. Governments and oppositions have defined roles, and it would be a mistake to pretend that they should somehow be suspended on this issue. That said, my predecessor expressed the wish that she would not want such a law to scrape through in Parliament. Support across political parties, she said, is vital. Climate change is the ultimate intergenerational issue, and governments change." Unquote. There's no unique policy package that will reduce New Zealand's emissions. We don't know at this stage how we will achieve the necessary long-term target. I want to underline that point. The UK didn't when it passed its legislation, and it still doesn't. That's not the point. The point is to set a long-term goal and increase the level of ambition in a measured, rigorously tested way. Long-term signals will shift investment and they will allow technological windows of opportunity to open and then be capitalised on. We cannot say in detail what those will be in the 2030s. We need to make them possible. There will be disagreements over how policies should be constructed. That's what democracies tend to focus on, and that's important. But I would echo my predecessor in pleading that the parties in Parliament leave no stone unturned in finding a way to put New Zealand's long-term goal beyond debate and agree on a mechanism to ensure that we keep making progress towards it. So there you are. I'm very happy now to take any questions. These are probably excessively complicated, but uh, it is important to understand that process and sequencing can affect the legislation that comes out in the wash. So, any questions? Please direct your questions.